So Nigel Watson, thank you very much for agreeing to do our, our lessons in leadership interview. Uh, it's great to have you with us today. Thank you very much. I'm very pleased to take part. Nigel, I think what would be really good to start us off is to give our listeners and our viewers a, a little bit of understanding of your background and how you've ended up as a senior non-executive director. So could you spend sort of three or four minutes just talking us through your career history and, and how you've ended up where you are today? Yes, well, I've had a fairly checkered history. I mean, I started off basically as a lawyer in the city, um, uh, specialising in, in maritime and shipping law, uh, which was fascinating. And um, I'd always wanted to be involved in politics. So I did some of that at university and, and even before university with young conservatives. Um, then in uh, 1992, I got myself elected to Parliament and served there for 18 years, uh, which was fascinating, absolutely fascinating. I have to say it gave me a, a, lots of real insights, but one real insight was um, the amount of, of time and money that's wasted by often big corporations in lobbying. You know, there's a huge lobbying industry now in this country, and a, a lot of that money is wasted. And so it gave me some very clear ideas of how captains of industry, um, once they got out of their comfort zone, were not really good at dealing with politicians and civil servants. Uh, so I stopped doing that uh, in 2010. Um, I should say that for the last, last seven years in Parliament, I was the shadow pensions minister. So I got involved in all the big pensions legislation in, in the uh, 04 and so on, 2004, etc. Um, so I've been going straight, uh, as it were, since 2010, uh, when I left Parliament, and um, I kind of quite easily slipped into a sort of non-executive role, partly because of my pensions background. I mean, it's not often a politician gets to uh, put his uh, legislative background into effect in the real world, but I mean, I did uh, uh, almost immediately uh, take on a role with Now Pensions, the third, now the th third biggest master trust in the UK. And that kind of came quite easily. I mean, I was chairman. So in a sense, having chaired endless meetings in Parliament and so on, that, that came quite easily. And also, um, I mean, whatever, you know, whatever people say, I mean, they say politics, they don't like politics, but politics with a small p is in everything, in every aspect of business and life in general. So I think it gives you a good grounding in, in what motivates people and how to persuade them to... Uh, to do what you want them to do, basically, or to do the right thing. And uh, I also took on a non-executive role as chair of the uh, Equity Release Council, which does what it says on the tin, really, uh, at a time when equity release was was growing very fast in this country. Um, so I'm not, I don't think it took a huge change in my approach or personality to move into a non-executive role. And I was very fortunate these things came up but I, I can see um, if you've been used to being a, a CEO or something it does take quite a change in mindset. I think one needs to sit back a bit and reflect um, that you're not there to run things you're there to oversee people who are running things and that means supporting them when they deserve it and uh, challenging them when they also when they deserve it. So that's kind of a tour d'horizon of my career to date and uh, I've also qualified as a uh, accredited professional independent trustee and I'm continuing to take a very close interest in, in the world of pensions. Okay. Andrew, you, you said that you, you brought up an interesting topic there about the difference between executive and non-executive and, and providing that constructive challenge when needed to the executive. Um, how do you go about doing that and building those strong working relationships with with the executive well of course the great sin in this kind of work is is what's termed group think um it is really important if you're a non-executive or a trustee and the roles are very obviously very similar that uh, one um keeps uh, an independent view viewpoint on things uh, there's very little point being a non-executive <clears throat> if you aren't coming in from outside with a completely clean slate and a sense of proportion about you know w w without being engaged in the day-to-day -day running of a, uh, an organization just just trying to look at globally and strategically at how it's how it's going and how it could be improved <coughs> um, 
but I think it is a very different mindset. Uh, you have to realize that you are not running the show. And I think the, first, the starting point is to build a really good, sensible, uh, productive relationship with the executive in whatever context it is. To make it clear, you're there to support them so that if the CEO has got a real problem, um, that he or she feels they can come and talk to you, particularly if you're the, in, the independent uh, uh, non-executive or the chair of, of the board or the chair of trustees. So as long as they can feel they can be open with you and, 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 and get your advice and support when they need it, that's important. Um, but there are occasions, and I've certainly been in that position, where you have to have what <clears throat> I believe they call at Sandhurst uh, an interview without coffee. Uh, where, where, where you do have to sit down with uh, the, uh, someone from the executive and say, look, this isn't going well, and I think these are the reasons, and uh, what can we do about it? And in extreme cases, uh, you may need to, to face up to the fact that the relationship isn't working and, and that person probably needs to be um, thinking of a different career path. So, so I, think, but I, I think it's quite important that, that people who've been in senior executive roles do think carefully about the non-executive role. Uh, I do, there are quite useful courses. I think the FT runs one still, just, just talking about being a non-executive. Yeah, I think one of the biggest challenges that executives who are looking to transition into the non-executive world face is, especially during the first 12 months of, of being a non-executive, is they want to tell people how to do the job rather than ask those questions uh, and, and, and constructively ask questions rather than tell, uh, tell the executive how to do its job. Um, so I think some of the courses that the that are out there, you know, the FT, as you say, the IOD is is a really good uh, grounding for individuals who are especially looking for that that first appointment. Absolutely. No, I mean I think there's a be a real temptation to say, oh well, I wouldn't do it like that, you know, or if it, if I was running it, I'd do this differently or that differently. You've got to hold back really, um, and um, realize that the role is very different, um, and. Uh, it is quite a transition. What would you say have been the sort of key leadership lessons you've learned throughout your career then? Well, I think they're, 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 they're true in every, in every sort of setting that I've <clears throat> been involved with. I mean, I think they come down to what I call the two C's, clarity and communication. Um, I think if you're a leader, you've got to, you've got to be, you've got to have clarity um, as to where you want to end up, what you want to achieve, and how you're going to do that. And then you've got, even more importantly, you've got to be able to communicate this to the people around you and make sure they understand what you're trying to achieve and why. Uh, so communication is incredibly important as well. Those, those two sort of two C's to me are the, are the, are the two main pillars of being a, a successful leader. And there's a, there's a kind of a, a third issue, which, which I'm very keen on, which is, um, for want of a better word, I call it, uh, humility. I mean, I think um, Ronald Reagan put it rather well when he said, uh, he said, in politics, it's amazing what you can achieve if you don't mind who gets the credit. And um, I think that's true in every, every field of endeavor. I think if you're, if you're happy for others to take the credit, as long as you get done what you want done then um then that can really uh sort of turbocharge your leadership um and make the people around you feel wanted and valued and and happy <laughs> no absolutely and um, we we often say that you know great leaders are made in times of crisis because things things inevitably go wrong and it's how we deal with things when they go wrong that makes better leaders what would you say has been the biggest leadership crisis you've faced and, and how did you overcome it? Well, I suppose <clears throat> going back quite a few years now, when I was um, in, in, the, in the House of Commons <clears throat> after the disastrous results for my party are uh, in 97, uh, we found ourselves reduced to um, about 120, 130 MPs and ushered in the, the Blair era. And I was a, a newly created whip. 
um, on our side. I mean, I, I've always called it a, a sort of battlefield commission because so many other people have been had been thrown out by the electorate. But um, that was a massive challenge because um, there you were running a much reduced parliamentary party. Um, bear in mind, most politicians run on uh, run on ego, and there wasn't much <clears throat> encouragement for ego because it was clear we were going to be out of power for quite some time. So there was the, there were very few levers you could use to get people to do things because they knew and you knew that uh, they weren't going to be getting any ministerial jobs. There were great temptations to go off and make money in the city or, or whatever, um, particularly about amongst people who had been ministers when we were in government. So that was a massive challenge, and it meant instead of a, uh, there, there was really no carrots and sticks you could use just to get people to turn up. To vote was quite an achievement, um, and we couldn't all, we couldn't allow uh, pairing, which, if you, as you know, is when you arrange with a member of the other side to, to not turn up and vote, so you can both do something else. Because if, if all our people paired, there'll still be there'd still have been hundreds hundreds of Labour MPs turning up. So it was a real challenge, just because all you had the only tool you had, or the only tools you had, were good humour and being able to persuade people. Uh, uh, but that was that was a huge challenge quite early on in my political career, um, and I think bigger than most challenges I've had to face. What keeps you going through the toughest periods? Well, I think the first thing the first thing to recognise is that that, that you know, um, uh, as Kipling put it, you know, that triumph and disaster are both imposters, that nothing is ever as bad as you think it is or as good as it is. Um, and when things are going well, um, I've always felt you need to get ready for the, for the crisis that's just around the corner. Um, I think the tough times are actually, in many ways, the most um, exciting because you're really facing difficult decisions a lot of businesses at the moment try, trying to keep their heads above water. It's a massive challenge, and you can see, you can see clearly um, how um, the imaginative leaders, particularly in, in business and industry, have have managed to adapt their business models to keep going uh, during this crisis, this pandemic, while while others have just fallen by the wayside. Um, and uh, I think. You know, it's that old saying that when the tide goes out, you see who's not wearing any swimming trunks. Um, <laughs> the fact is, um, a lot of businesses are failing and will fail uh, because they just weren't able to adapt. So I think, I think in tough, the tough times, I think it's really important just to keep your eye on the prize, what you're trying to achieve, realise it might be more difficult and take a bit longer than you thought. But if you don't do that, you're just drifting in the grip of forces beyond your control. Okay. How do you how do you go about maintaining compassionate leadership, um, especially when somebody's performance is is not at the level you would expect it to be? And and how do you go about getting them back to where where you need to be? <clears throat> well, this in many ways is the most difficult part of leadership. Um, because in, in many ways it's the most personal. Um, uh, I think, uh, I mean, I've, you know, I've sacked various senior people in my time and I hope I've done it um, humanely uh, and constructively. And I think it would, in each of those cases, it would have been less humane for all concerned, including the person, to just let things drift on. Um, I think you've got to... Um, I think the first thing is, is if somebody's not clearly not cutting the mustard, I think the first question you ask yourself is, is any of it my fault? How about going back to my earlier two pillars? I mean, is it because I haven't been clear enough on what we're trying to achieve and how we're going to achieve it? Uh, have I failed to communicate properly with this individual? Um, and then, of course, you can move on to try and be constructive, have a, uh, a, a performance improvement plan, sit down with them and see what um what can be done try and set some some realizable goals for them day to day week to week month to month but of course if that doesn't work 
uh, you're not doing anybody any favors by by letting things drag on and, and there, there sometimes is comes a time where you have to say well you should really think of doing something else um and there's the old um the old peter principle that most people are promoted once too often you know you, you, i mean i've seen people who have done really well in a more junior role but but when they've been promoted to something more senior with more responsibilities have, have, have just simply not been able to cope and you're not doing them any favors any more than you're doing the organization any favors by trying to fudge the issue so it is possible to be to be incredibly compassionate in in these situations but the least compassionate uh, is just to let things drag on because the person's obviously unhappy they feel like they, they're not they're not cutting the mustard and the organization suffers and you, you, you mentioned there that the first thing you do when, when there's a problem is, is look at yourself and see if there is anything you could do differently. Um, how would you say you go about evaluating yourself as a leader? Uh, well, <clears throat> well, first of all, I, I mean, I think regular evalu self-evaluation is actually rather important um, in the same way as when I was chairing a board of trustees, it was always important to do evaluations of one's colleagues and then self-evaluation so everyone was open about one's pluses and minuses <clears throat> i think if you're in a leadership role it, it, it's it, the danger is that you kind of you kind of carry on um doing whatever you're doing without looking closely at whether it's it's the right thing whether you're achieving it are you achieving what you're supposed to be achieving so i think you have to evaluate your personal leadership skills regularly um, and be pretty tough with yourself really because if you're failing then the organization's going to fail or could well fail and and people around you will will lose momentum will lose enthusiasm uh, because you've you've lost your enthusiasm that's why my, my strong view on the whole is that the really big jobs being CEO of a big company and so on, um, one shouldn't really do for more than five or six years because uh, people invariably, inevitably become a bit stale and um, need to move on, do something else, have a break. <laughs> which, which actually brings me nicely into the point around um, how do you sort of understand and what would you say is a key indicator that you're your own leadership is becoming less effective? Um, well, I think the key indicator is whether the people around me um, in, in an organization are becoming less motivated, um, uh, whether they're, they're, you know, whether they're, they're no longer keen to get into the office or to get onto Zoom at the moment, <clears throat> um, you know, to, to, to start working on another day for the organization. Because that suggests that 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 you're not communicating your enthusiasm, etc. Uh, as always, uh, Napoleon put it very well. He said, "A, a leader is a dealer in hope." Um, and I think it's really important that. I mean, I, I've never met any leader who was a sort of glass half empty person. I think leaders, by definition, have to be have to be enthusiastic, optimistic, um, not to the point of being blind to, to problems and how to solve them. But I think they do need to, to carry people with them. As, um, as Eisenhower has said, um, the art of it's, leadership is the art of getting someone else to do something you want done because they want to do it. That's, that's the key thing, trying to in, imbue them with a the sense that this is something they really want to achieve. And if you see people switching off in meetings or perhaps not you know taking more sick days than is normal and then, then there's clearly something something amiss so you need to reset your uh, leadership and their roles of course okay. who would you say you admire most as a leader and, and why well i guess it's a bit predictable but i suppose um it has to be um winston churchill um because first of all he was really good at the clarity thing at the hope thing i mean he was incredible at, at inspiring people <clears throat> when there didn't seem to be much grounds for for uh, hope and expectation I and mean, there's a lovely story somebody said that a few days after 
Churchill became Prime Minister in 1940, um, he's, this person saw a senior civil servant in shirt sleeves running down a corridor. He said, when I saw that, I thought just, we just might win, you know, because Churchill had put such a, 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 a sort of powerful kind of explosion behind the civil service and the armed forces and everyone else who was feeling pretty down. And also, of course, taking my other pillar, he was the communicator par excellence. Uh, he was, um, he was uh, incredibly good at communicating with everybody, particularly the man in the street, uh, as to what he was going to achieve, what everyone was going to achieve, and, but how hard it was going to be. He didn't pull any punches, but he was, he was the communicator par excellence. Um, so I guess it's got to be him, really. What would you say are overrated leadership qualities? Um, I think we, we, in our role in executive search, we, we often get confronted with clients telling us things like, we want you to find us a name, or, you know, we want this type of individual. And a lot of the things are often around the cult of the leader, and uh, rather than looking at rather than looking at leadership objectively and what, what an individual's achieved. Um, so what would you say are, are the leadership qualities which are overrated and, and, and why do you think that? Um, <clears throat> I think um, I think there are two qualities, <coughs> excuse me, I think are over, two qualities I think are overrated. One is, um, don't get me wrong, one is hard work. I mean, I think it, it's interesting, whenever you read these um, these uh, biogs uh, in the Sunday Times business section, for example, these, these, these high powered guys and girls always claim to get up at some ludicrous time in the morning um, <laughs> and, and do an hour in the gym and then, uh, you know, and go to bed at one o'clock in the morning or something. I mean, that is, that is not sensible. I mean, I think leaders need holidays and they need to have time to reflect um, uh, on whatever it is they're trying to achieve. So I think an obsession with detail and, and putting in the hours is just absurd. Um, uh, and doesn't necessarily deliver. But the main, I mean, the other more, perhaps more important one, which I'm sure you uh, hear a lot about, is charisma. Now, you know, charisma's a sort of double-edged sword, really. You can have bad charisma and you can have good charisma, but you don't actually need to be a charismatic leader to succeed. Um, and, and I think of lots of people in business and industry who, who, you know, you wouldn't look twice at as you'd pass them in the street. You know, they're clearly not a sort of charism. You know, they don't have that aura. But I mean, a lot of that can get in the way. I think that this cult of the leader, of the charismatic leader, you know, uh, we've seen a, in recent times some, ma some major failures where people, have, you know, to, not mentioning anyone by name, but I mean, people have gone for the star um, uh, asset manager, fund managers, um, um, forgetting the, the small print that says, you know, past performance is no guarantee for future performance and all that, and then come a cropper. Um, so charisma on its own, charisma without substance can be very dangerous. Um, and um, uh, I think, uh, I think it's, it is much overrated as a, um, as a quality for leaders. That is not to say, um, one shouldn't be looking to um, enthusiasm and ability to, to communicate enthusiasm to people. That's a, that's a rather different issue altogether, uh, much more important and useful when you're running any kind of organization. Oh, absolutely. And I, 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 I sort of smile a little bit when you talk about uh, these, these great business leaders getting up at 4 a.m. And, and hitting the gym and, and they work until you know, midnight, 1 a.m. You know, frankly, either either they're superheroes or, or I don't really know how they do it because if 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 I have to get out of bed before seven a.m. in the morning, um, all hell breaks loose in our house. I'm, I'm I'm not able to function for the rest of the day. So, uh, uh, quite how these these people manage to do it, it, it always leaves me uh, astonished. I think. Well, um, uh, absolutely, and eventually it all comes comes uh, comes unstuck. Uh, and Margaret Thatcher was a perfect example. You know, she would she always claimed she'd get by on four hours sleep, but sooner or later it catches up with you. Um, and um, I think 
you've got to be re there's an element of being relaxed about leadership uh, you know and if you're const if you're constantly downing espressos and, and just to keep awake uh, you're obviously not you're not going to be too relaxed and you do need time to think i, I went to uh, uh, a lecture a lecture a few years ago in the guild hall given by terry smith you know the great the really successful fund manager he just brought out a book actually um really good good read and he was really interesting i mean for example he said he he lamented the end of the city business lunch um nothing to do with the food or the booze but i mean he just he just said the trouble is nowadays you've got all these people sitting in in their offices staring at a screen they might have a sandwich at their desk and they feel compelled to do something he said whereas i he says i always thought the business lunch was a way of going out of the office talking perhaps about other things having some time out rather than this compulsion you have to be doing something the whole time and of course he's built an incredibly successful fund based on buying really good companies shares and keeping them a bit like warren buffett you know not constantly buying and selling and this frenetic activity uh, that uh, people seem to think is normal these days i think the business launch thing is interesting uh, at the start of my career we was we were still doing them but they were being phased out a little bit um but, but it always amazes me when I go to Paris because I have a couple of clients based out there. Um, and that always involves a business lunch, which is always a couple of hours and always includes a glass of champagne uh, and, and, a, and a nice glass of wine with lunch. And it's, you know, it's a really alien concept for me doing that on a, on a lunchtime um, on a working day. You know, it's, it, it, it's just an alien concept to us now. Um, but actually it does give you that time to, I suppose, decompress and talk about things which, which are not work related um, and get away from that pressure of, of the work that, you know, you're doing on that particular day. Oh, I totally agree. I mean, I used to have a major client in, when I was a practicing solicitor in uh, Paris and uh, yes, that's, uh, they had a suite of dining rooms and as soon as you arrived, you're whisked into a, in one of these rooms for a long lunch. Um, but productivity in France per person is higher than it is here, so they must be doing something right. Um, but I think having time in the middle of the day, I mean, you don't have to go out and have a three-course lunch. And I think certainly in my very early days in the city, they were it was slightly taken to extremes um, with some people. But it does give you chance to, uh, as you say, decompress. Um, and that's why I'm I mean, I think a really important thing for any leader is to have time to themselves where they can reflect um, on things, some time in every day. I really, you know, I think they should, one should set aside a time. That doesn't have to be the same time every day, but a piece of each day where you don't take calls, you don't do emails. Um, and emails, of course, are a modern curse because uh, there are so many of them, but uh, you, you know, you can spend all day dealing with emails. Um, I think setting aside particular times to do them is, is probably quite uh, healthy. But, you know, leaders need to reflect. They need to sit down quietly and think through um, what's happening around them. And, um, uh, and I, I just wonder how many of them really do these days. Um, it's, uh, but as I say, Terry Smith is very good value and uh, well worth listening to on these things. I think that critical reflection piece is, you know, it, it, it's absolutely essential. And I think it's one of the first things you learn on any MBA course is to be self-critically reflective. Um, and it, it just stands you in good stead for, for the rest of your career. I think so. Um, and also, I think the other part of the other side of that coin is that whatever you say, if you're a leader, is taken very much to heart by people in fact you know you kind of hope and expect it will be but one of the best lessons I ever had in life was my old English teacher at school who said always think before you speak um, and Churchill put it again good old Churchill put it differently he said one of the reasons he, he, he spoke cigars was that often in life he was about to say something uh, brutal and, and critical of somebody but by the time he'd taken the cigar out of his mouth he kind of reflected and thought better, thought better of it um, 
or uh, another very good example, um, uh, Abraham Lincoln, um, our, our, the day after the, or the Battle of Gettysburg, which is a hugely bloody affair in the American Civil War, he wrote a really critical, um, horrible letter to the commanding general, General Meade, who had failed, having won the battle, had failed to pursue the Confederates uh, back into the South. And the letter was never sent. It was found in his archives after he died because he clearly thought, um, you know, I'm not there. I am not amongst the dead and the wounded. You know, I, I, there may have been very good reasons why he, they didn't feel able to pursue the, the enemy. But um, I mean, anything like that, I, I have a rule that if I'm writing something really critical about somebody or something, I, look, I let it reflect on it overnight. Uh, I think there are far too many people have been caught out by late night emails or tweets. Um, dear old Donald Trump. Um, uh, I used to think he was sending these in the middle of the night because he'd had a few drinks and then I learned that he was a teetotaler so he's not even got an excuse really. Um, but people obviously listen to his tweets or read his tweets because he's president of the United States but if you're a leader of any sort you've got to be very careful how you phrase things. People um, people can take umbrage uh, or be just genuinely upset because you you know you've said something that uh, that for them is a very powerful piece of criticism. Nigel I, I guess one last question before we finish up is you know have you got any particular tips or advice for our for our listeners and our viewers um, to help them in their careers? Yes, I mean, I think it's all about integrity and self-knowledge. Um, as Robbie Burns put it, to see ourselves as others see us. Um, you may not be cut out to be a leader, and that's okay. Um, and they're the ones who get all the publicity and the, you know, the, and the coverage, etc. Being a leader is quite tough, very tough, in fact. Um, and uh, there's a very good reason why they get paid well. On the whole, um, not everyone can be a leader. Not everyone should want to be a leader. I think you just need to find your own niche, and that comes down and say to your own integrity, your own view of your own self worth, your own a really clear view of your pluses and minuses, your strengths and weaknesses. That's important. Um, but having got through those tests, if if you feel you want to be a leader, well, get out there and do it. There's no there's no uh, easy map, roadmap for being a leader. You just have to go out and do it and make mistakes along the way. I mean, you know, actually, some of the people I know who've done really well in life, in politics, in business, in industry, have made all sorts of mistakes uh, and have admitted to their mistakes. But as, as someone once said, what does not kill us makes it stronger. And uh, any any leader who's not had a crisis or two to deal with uh, is a worry from my point of view because how on earth they're going to handle it when it does happen as it inevitably will. Okay. Well Nigel Watson thank you very much for your time today um, and I look forward to speaking to you again soon. Thank you Paul.